thank you, Dean, and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. This is just wonderful, and I'm very excited to be here. I've never been here before, but I'm coming back in the fall, so this is going to be a two times in Little Rock year. Um, I thought what I would do would be to kind of give a short version of um, a much longer presentation that I sometimes give, uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of work I do and the kind of things that I'm interested in. Um, I consider my own work for the last 10 years to be in the area of food systems. And by food systems, I mean the uh, interaction between agriculture, food, nutrition, and health. Um, and by the health, the particular areas of health that I'm interested in are obesity and food safety. And these may not seem like they're related, uh, but if you want people to eat healthfully, um, they're going to be eating fruits and vegetables, and those fruits and vegetables better be safe uh, if they're going to eat them. And two of my books in the last um, eight years have been on the political side. Food politics is the one that's available here. Um, what to Eat is a book for the general public that is about food issues in general. And the other two books, Safe Food and Pet Food Politics, are really about food safety and our food safety system. And my starting point for all of this is always public confusion about diet and health. The public is demonstrably confused about what to eat, some of it having to do with the research, some of it having to do with the fact that nutrition really is really, is really quite complicated um, in some ways, particularly if you look at things from the standpoint of single nutrients. But I think the public confusion is really too bad because you don't have to be a genius to figure out what it is you're supposed to eat for dinner. In fact, it's so simple I can summarize it in one slide. Uh, eat less, move more. Um, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, don't eat too much junk food, enjoy what you're eating, and please don't eat my book. Um, if it seems more complicated than that, it's surely because of the effect of that advice on the food industry. If you advise people to eat less um, in order to help them prevent obesity or manage their weight better, um, eating less is really bad for business. And this was expressed very, very nicely by an executive of Coca-Cola a few years ago um, who explained that it used to be that obesity was nothing that anybody ever had to worry about in the food industry. It was a matter of personal responsibility. If you're fat, it's your fault. Um, but more recently, the food industry has been taken to task for its marketing practices, and all of a sudden, they're faced with the problem of having to deal with something um, that they never had to do before. Now, the part of the reason why um, obesity is a problem for the food industry has to do with the fact that it's not just a cosmetic problem. It raises the risk for a number of chronic diseases, among them particularly type 2 diabetes. And it's not that every overweight person is going to get type 2 diabetes or anything else for that matter. The percentages are still quite small. But it does raise the risk, and rates of type 2 diabetes have been rising in proportion to rising rates of obesity. And this is especially a problem in children who never used to have type 2 diabetes until about 20 years ago. Um, and now it's very common in overweight children. So if it's a problem, then the question is, what do you do about it if you're a public health person like me? And there are two approaches. The first is the personal responsibility approach. Um, from, and I point this out from this rather offensive cover from The Economist. Um, it had the article that was in this store, in the Economist magazine about this, I had this incredible statement that if people want to overeat and eat their, their waves to an early grave, it's their responsibility, uh, let them do it. And if you're a public health person and you want to help individuals do, take personal responsibility for what they eat, then you have to teach individuals how to eat better. It's really simple. You just tell people what would be healthy and they'll do it, right? 
Well, the reason that you're all laughing has to do with the fact that there's something else going on here, which is what the New York Times a few years ago called the gorge yourself environment, an environment with too much food, too many choices, and far too much eating. And here, if you're a public health person wanting to do an intervention, you need to do more than just tell people what to eat. You have to do more than education. You have to change society which is much, much more difficult to contemplate doing. Also, if you're going to change society, you need to ask the question, what is it about society that needs to change? And for, to answer that question, we need to go back to the dawn of the obesity epidemic, which actually wasn't all that long ago. It started in the early 1980s. Up until the 1980s, rates of overweight and obesity in the United States were about constant. Starting in the early 1980s, they began to rise quite rapidly. So we need to ask the question, what happened in the early 1980s that encouraged people either to eat more, um, do move less, um, or do both at the same time? And I'm not going to be saying much about the moving less part of uh, the equation because I think most of the research shows that overweight is due to eating more. There's lots and lots of evidence that people are eating more now and much, much less evidence that people are moving less. So let's just ask the question, why are people eating more? Um, and for that, we have to go to some things that seem very, very remote from what goes on at the di dinner table. And there are lots of reasons why people are eating more. But I think two are particularly important. And the first was agricultural policy. Starting in the 1970s, American agricultural policy changed from paying farmers to grow, not to grow food, to paying farmers to grow as much food as they possibly could. And the result was mountains of corn and other kinds of food in a sea of farm subsidies, which no administration has ever been able to get rid of. Um, the result of the overproduction of food was a sharp increase in the number of calories available in the food supply for consumption up across the entire period that the Department of Agriculture has counted this sort of thing, the number of calories in the food supply was about 3,200 3, per day per capita. Um, now, that's not what people are actually eating. That's what's available. What's produced in this country, less exports plus imports. Starting in the early 1980s, there was a very sharp increase in the number of calories available in the food supply. And even if a lot of that is wasted, as the Department of Agriculture says, uh, it still created an environment in which food companies had to sell food. For food companies, the, where selling food in an environment in which there was nearly twice as much food as anybody needed, um, it be, they had to do things to try to sell more food. It, was, it just became very competitive. But that's not all. A second thing happened in the early 1980s, um, which was what, what was considered the advent of the shareholder value movement. The shareholder value movement was attributed to a speech given by Jack Welch, who was then head of General Electric, who made a speech saying, enough of this blue chip stock stuff with long term returns on investment. We as investors want higher returns on our investment, and we want them right now. And so Wall Street, in response to the shareholder value movement, began evaluating corporations in a different way. And they began insisting that corporations file quarterly returns in which they demonstrate growth um, in profits. And for all companies, this posed many, many serious problems, which we're seeing in Wall Street right now. Uh, but for food companies, it posed a particularly difficult problem because food companies were already trying to sell food in an environment in which there was twice as much food available as anybody needed. And the result was to put enormous pressure on food companies to figure out new and innovative ways to get people to eat more food Actually, all they cared about was that they bought the food. They didn't care whether people ate it or not. Um, and in doing that, food companies changed society in ways that really nobody noticed. So let me talk about the ways in which society changed. 
because there was so much food available, food, the price of food dropped, and it became cheaper to eat food outside the home. Um, in the next series of slides, and in fact throughout, any place you see an exclamation point, it's shorthand for there's lots and lots of research that shows that doing this is going to encourage you to eat more calories than you would if you were cooking at home and not doing this. So, food outside the home has more calories. The obvious um, way to see this is at a buffet. In fact, it's called the buffet syndrome, where you take a little of this and a little of that, and before long, you've eaten a lot of calories. Uh, the most obvious example is the beginning of larger portions. This is my former doctoral student, Lisa Young, who did a historical study on when larger portions began to be introduced in the food supply, the early 1980s. No surprise. Here she is at her thesis defense um, with some cups that she bought at our local movie theater. The white one on the right is an eight ounce Department of Agriculture serving size for soft drink. If it doesn't have too much ice in it, it holds 100 calories worth of soft drink. You can't even get it anymore. The others she got at our local movie theater, the big double gulp, um, uh, if, without too much ice, holds 64 ounces and 800 calories. And the evidence shows that that cup is not passed down the aisle and shared among everyone <laughs> who's sitting there. Uh, it's consumed by one person. Larger portions have more calories, not intuitively obvious, alas. Um, another, I like to ask the question, when did it become okay to eat in bookstores? When I first came to NYU, our library had signs all over it saying, if you so much as set foot into this place with a drink or a sandwich, you are going to be expelled from school so fast you won't even know what hit you. Now we have two cafes in our library. Uh, proximity is another one of the reasons why the food police, like me, are so concerned about soft drink machines in schools is because the research shows that the more vending machines there are in schools, the more product is purchased from them, and the more product that is purchased, the more calories kids are eating uh, from soft drinks. Low prices are another. Low prices may be a thing of the past, but you could still go into McDonald's with something like $5 and, and find that you have a choice. You can buy five hamburgers or one salad for that $5. What's that about? That's about agricultural policy that links uh, agricultural policy to the way people are actually eating. It has to do with farm subsidies and all of the other ways in which our government supports some kinds of foods but considers fruits and vegetables to be specialty crops and, not, uh, and certainly not subsidized. So these are the kinds of things that a, a lawyer in San Francisco named Michelle Simon discussed in her excellent book, Appetite for Profit, in which she talked about the enormous pressures on food companies, pressures from advocates, from regulators who were dying to regulate food companies, from lawyers who were dying to sue them, um, and from Wall Street, which simply wants them to make more money every 90 days. And food companies responded uh, at first by going through all the stages of death and denial, and then um, actually taking action. And they took two kinds of action, one public and one private. Uh, the private stuff is just fighting back by lobbying, by attacking critics, by blaming it on inactivity or personal responsibility. And if you want to see what some of that looks like, you can go on my website, foodpolitics.com, and take a look at the letters they write me. I post them all under controversies. But what I want to talk about a little bit, because it's what the public sees, is how food companies are changing products in order to sell more food. And there are three things they do, and I want to talk about health claims, functional foods, and self-endorsements as the leading strategies. So let me start with health claims. Health claims on food packages that, it redu that Cheerios reduce cholesterol or whatever didn't used to be there because the FDA used to be really tough about this kind of thing and would say if foods advertise themselves as having 
um, disease prevention or health promotion effects. They were acting like a drug, and if they acted like a drug, they had to be treated like a drug, and they would need to prove that Cheerios reduced um, cholesterol with clinical trials. And you can, if you just give it a moment's thought, um, <laughs> you know that the results of that aren't going to be very meaningful. Um, in 1990, when Congress passed the law that put the nutrition facts label on food packages, the food industry said, if we have to say what's wrong with our foods, how much saturated fat, cholesterol, sugar, and salt we have in our products, um, you need to let us say what's good about them. And Congress agreed and forced the FDA to, be to begin allowing health claims. At first, the FDA said there had to be scientific substantiation for the claims, but then companies took the FDA to court, and the courts have ruled in favor of the company's right to advertise the health benefits of their products with or without scientific substantiation on the grounds of free speech. Um, whether the Founding Fathers meant the First Amendment to do this, I don't know, but that's how the courts have interpreted it. So the result now is that every food in a supermarket has a health claim on it. And here's one of my favorite examples, because it has so many. Um, it has little tokens that tell you how nutritious it is. It's going to make you smart. It's going to make your heart healthy. It doesn't have any trans fat. It will lower both your blood pressure and your cholesterol level. And it has an endorsement from the American Heart Association, even though sugars appear nine times in the ingredient list. Um, the American Heart Association only cares about fat and cholesterol and doesn't care about sugar or calories. Um, and then companies make food functional. Functional foods are foods that have something added to it above and beyond what's originally in the food that's supposed to make you healthier. Um, and so here's one of the, a collection of my favorite examples. These are foods that have the omega-3 fatty acid, DHA, added to them. So it's now added to milk. It's added to peanut butter. Remember when we could still eat peanut butter? Um, and the, it's added to mayonnaise. And I, my favorite is it's in these Oreo-type cookies. Um, so you look at that and you think, oh, these must be really healthy. But omega-3s were so 2008. We're now in 2009. And the nutrient that's being put into everything these days is, cal is calcium and vitamin D, particularly vitamin D. Never mind that a serving of this cereal only has 10% of the day's um, requirement for vitamin D, it goes up to 25% if you add milk. And cereal company makers, cereal makers have told me that the whole purpose of cereal is to get kids to drink milk. Um, but the, the other really hot nutrient is antioxidants. There's just antioxidants in everything. And this is, again, one of my favorite examples. These are, it's a chocolate chip candy bar or fiber bar. Um, and the chocolate isn't even, it's naturally and artificially flavored. I don't know. Um, but antioxidants are a really big thing, and it's gotten so bad that even regular foods have to advertise their antioxidant quality. And of course, the pomegranate people are the people who do this better than anybody else. But you don't have to bother eating those messy pomegranates with all those annoying seeds. You can get it in a pill, or you can get it in jelly beans the same way. Um, and so I think you have to ask the question, is a better or functional food product really a good choice? And that's the fundamental question uh, that I think really underlies all of these issues about functional foods, um, particularly when they're targeted at children. And here's a brand new one that's just come out. This is a juice drink um, from the Nestle Corporation, no relation that is being advertised for children. Um, and it's a juice drink with DHA and a juice drink with a bunch of vitamins in it and prebiotic fiber. Uh, and these are supposed to make your kids smart and make your kid immune. And again, if you just give this a moment's thought, um, you know that it would be very difficult to demonstrate this in a clinical trial. But this brings me to the whole question of marketing to children, which is a really big issue. You can argue that it, one of the great things about being an adult is you get to eat anything you want anytime you want to. It's what's nice about being grown up. Um, but kids are another matter, and when you're talking about personal responsibility, it's hard to 
lay that on children. And this report from late 2005 uh, reviewed a whole lot of research on marketing to children and basically said, you know, it works. It works really well. Um, and a lot of money is spent on it. And there's a big debate about how much money food companies spend marketing to children. This report said probably about $7 billion a year. Um, and then a report came out from the Federal Trade Commission last year that said, no, 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 it was only $2 billion a year. Well, I don't know about you, but a billion dollars is beyond my comprehension. So I need to break it down into a smaller unit. And here's an example of, um, of advertising expenditure just for radio, television, and print, uh, $32.8 million um, Kellogg spent just for advertising Cheez-Its. Just Cheez-Its. Any nationally advertised brand is going to have an advertising budget in the multi-million dollar range. And I can assure you that no federal agency has anywhere near that kind of money to promote healthy eating. Now, marketers want to advertise to kids for three reasons. Uh, the first is brand loyalty. Um, if you choose Coca-Cola when you're young, you will never drink Pepsi for the rest of your life. The second is what's called in the trade the pester factor, and it's exactly what it sounds like. And if you want to know what that's about, you just take a two-year-old to a grocery store and you'll figure it out in a minute. The third one is the one that I think is the most insidious, and it's the one that really I find most troublesome because it gets right into the issue of personal responsibility, and that is the business about kids' food. What food marketers want kids to think is that they're supposed to eat their own food made for them. Kids are supposed to eat kids' food. Uh, things in funny packages with cartoons on them, unidentified food objects, uh, chicken fingers, all that kind of thing. They're not supposed to eat the boring adult food that their parents are eating, hopefully. The boring adult healthy food that their parents are eating. They're supposed to eat kids' food. And I think this is so undermining of parental authority around food issues. It makes kids think that they know more about what they're supposed to eat than their parents do, uh, that it's reason enough to be really concerned about marketing to children. Um, let's go on to the third thing, which is the self-endorsement. This is going to be a big issue these days because it's coming to us. It's already in a supermarket near you, but more of it is going to be coming. And the way self-endorsements work is that companies like Pepsi-Cola, this is, or Frito-Lay is a Pepsi-Cola uh, company, and these are Canadian, but it's the same thing here. Uh, they set up their own nutritional criteria for ranking their products, and then they... Um, look to see how many products meet the criteria that they've set up, and they put a sticker on the products that meet those criteria. So here are two of PepsiCo's Better For You products. Um, remember, a Better For You choice is not necessarily a good choice. Um, all the companies have done this. So here's one from Kraft. Um, this is a Lunchables, which is not a, you know, it's aimed at kids and it's not a product that most nutritionists would recommend kids eat for lunch because it's got a full ounce of sugars and meets 25% of the day's allotment for saturated fat and cholesterol. Um, but it qualifies for Kraft Sensible Solutions self-endorsement because it's uh, got calcium added to it. Now, Hannaford Supermarkets, which is a chain of supermarkets in the Northeast, uh, decided to ask independent nutritionists to develop criteria not tied to any particular food company for evaluating f food products in the store. And the idea would be that products that met the minimal criteria would get one star, and then some foods would get two stars, and the really, really, really nutritious ones would get three stars. And when they applied those independent criteria to 27,000 products in the supermarket, only 23% qualified for even one star. And of that 23%, 80% were fruits and vegetables in the produce section. So if independent nutritionists set up the criteria, the results are quite different. And I say this because there are now two different kinds of food evaluation systems in use. The NuVal system is a scoring system that was developed by a physician at Yale 
um, that has gone into some supermarkets also in the Northeast. The traffic light system is the one that's being used in Great Britain now. And the, the research shows that consumers like the traffic light system, they understand it, and they understand that they're not supposed to eat the ones with the red lights on them, and they're not buying the ones with the red lights on them. The food industry hates the traffic light system. And for that reason, they have partnered with the American Society of Nutrition, which is a group of uh, organization of nutrition researchers. It's the leading organization of nutrition researchers in the country to develop a different scoring, a, a food scoring system that will replace all the individual ones in the United States. And the criteria are interesting. I think they're rather loose. Um, they allow 25% of the calories per serving from added sugars, and 480 milligrams per serving of sodium, which seems really high to me. It's more than a gram of sodium. Um, and I'm really quite disturbed that a society to which I belong is doing this. I don't think, I don't think, I think it puts the society in a conflict of interest because the society is not in a position to independently evaluate the criteria or, or the competing systems that are coming into place in supermarkets. I see this as an attempt to head off traffic lights. So altogether, we have a situation in which uh, we have created an environment in which I think not conspiratorially, but as part of the normal way of doing business, has the government, the food industry, and sometimes health and nutrition professionals collaborating to encourage people to eat more. And I would be very depressed about this, except that I think we're in the middle of a food revolution that I think is enormously exciting. Uh, when the New York Times has an article and calls it a revolution, it's a revolution, right? If you call it a revolution, it's a revolution. Now, I, I have an appointment at NYU as an unlicensed professor of sociology, and I teach a course in food sociology, um, and I talk a lot in that course about food as a social movement, and I think we're right in the middle of one. And it's not a typical social movement like the civil rights movement or the women's movement or the environmental movement. It's much more diffuse than that and focused on lots and lots of mini movements, all of which are aimed at creating a food system that's healthier for people or for um, the planet. And uh, I'll, some examples of it are um, the good, clean, fair, and slow food movement. I'm wearing my slow food pin here. Uh, notice that it's in revolutionary terms. And what they're talking about here is food that's good for health, clean for the environment, fair to the workers who are producing it, and savored for its delicious uh, qualities. We can't ever forget that. Um, the organic movement. Here you can measure how its success quantitatively by sales figures of organics, which went up steadily um, from the early 1990s to 2006. They went down a little bit last year, but they're still moving along quite well. Um, and notice here, too, it's in movement terms. And then the locavore movement, the incredible movement to try to encourage people to eat uh, if not all of their foods locally grown, some of their foods locally grown. And here, too, it's measurable because you can count the increase in the number of farmers markets in American towns and throughout the country. And when local food gets on the cover of Time magazine, you know it's mainstream. The one that has surprised me the most um, is the animal welfare movement. I used to think that uh, animal welfare was just something that um, was something that the animal rights people were interested in. But animal welfare has gotten, gone mainstream also. I was a member of the Pew Commission on Industrial Farm Animal uh, Production, which produced this report last year. And we, look, we came to the conclusion from our visits to lots and lots of industrial farms that if we raised animals in a healthier way, it would be better for the animals, better for the people who are working with them, better for the communities in which these places are located, and better for human health. 
Um, and so that's part of it too. That's all on the production side. On the consumption side, there's the school food, food movement, and I'm fond of saying that this is not an elitist Alice Waters in Berkeley phenomenon, but it's also happening in New York City schools, which are among some of the poorest um, schools in the country. There's 1,200 schools in the system, and we have Chef Jorge Colazo, who is school by school attempting to improve the quality of food that's served to kids, and I have been to schools in some of the poorest areas of New York City, in the most inner of the inner city, and seen teenage boys eating salads with my very own eyes. It can be done. It can be done. Um, we have calorie posting in fast food restaurants in Manhattan, and it's the most entertaining thing in the world to go look at. Um, first of all, you can't believe how many calories there are in these foods. Um, but also, it's having an effect, if not on the people who are going to these places, because a lot of people who go to fast food restaurants aren't going there because they care about calories. What it's doing is making the purveyors of these foods look at the calories that are in them and trying to figure out ways to lower them. So this is an environmental shift that is happening without the customers even knowing it. So it may have a big effect but an unexpected one. And then one of the most recent ones is what I call the real food movements, or the anti-processed food movement. And this is a group out of Berkeley, uh, out of Oakland, California, that did a survey of nutritionists and asked nutritionists what they thought healthy foods were. And, the, uh, the, and they came up with this report in which they say healthy foods are those that are minerally, minimally processed, contain natural, not added nutrients, don't have any additives, don't have hormones or antibiotics, are produced in ways that are kind to animals and fair to farm workers, and that are available, accessible, and affordable to everybody. That's what healthy foods are. I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about that movement. So on the personal responsibility side, um, I'm advocating eating food, not food products, eating smaller portions if you can figure out how to do that. I want to see local farmers supported. I think everybody should be learning how to cook at home and teaching kids how to cook, um, and growing food whenever it's possible. Even at my university, which is the most urban place in the world, we have uh, the, the university's hired a gardener who is planting vegetables in street planters. It's very amusing to see it. And then on the social responsibility side, I think we as a society need to think about ways in which we can change policy. And I have a laundry list of policies that I think need work, ranging from improving school food and preventing marketing to kids to a lot of issues having to do with a better food safety system. Um, and if we really want to get serious about doing something about the way people eat in America, we really have to do something about redressing income inequity and find ways to be fair to people in need. And then the root of cor corruption in our society is the way we finance um, our, ca our election campaigns. I think we need to do something about that so our elected representatives will represent uh, the people in public health rather than corporate health. And I think it's time to take a good hard look at Wall Street and see the way Wall Street and look at the way Wall Street evaluates corporations. And that used to seem like something completely bizarre when I used to talk about it. But you know, Wall Street's caught up with that. Um, and we may see some changes. And of course, the big unknown these days is what the world food crisis is going to do and how it's going to affect our food system. Um, and that's a big unknown. And another big unknown is policy, but I show this photograph of um, the organic garden that's being planted at the White House, not because I think an organic garden um, represents a major policy change that's going to have an enormous effect on our food system, but because it's symbolic value for food activists and food advocates is absolutely enormous. It is a sign that the government is interested in food advocacy, and I think everyone who is interested in 
and food advocacy should take this as a sign to get busy, now is the time. So I hope you'll join me in food advocacy. And if any of this encourages you to become food advocates, then I will, have feel, I will feel that this trip down here has been well worth it. Thank you very much. I'm Patrick Kennedy, Director of Public Programs. We uh, have time for uh, quite a few questions. If you would raise your hand, we have two mics roaming around, and we will pass you the mic. We'll start with you over there, sir. Thank you for that enjoyable lecture. I was wondering if you had any points of view. I know there's been some discussion about taxing mm -hmm. foods that are uh, dense in calories and low nutrition, and there's mm -hmm. also been some discussion about subsidies mm -hmm. for uh, more healthier food. And mm -hmm. Do you have any viewpoints about how those programs might work and, and whether you would support them? Mm -hmm. I much prefer subsidies. The problem with taxes is that you get into the business of regressive taxes where they're harder on the poor than the rich. Um, but we had this thing in New York State where the governor was proposing an 18% um, tax on soft drinks. And I was forced to support that. Um, I mean, it wouldn't have been my first choice, but you know, there it was. And he, here's a situation where um, the first thing you say to somebody who's overweight is, soft drinks, uh, why don't you get rid of those? Because they're calories with no nutrient value at all. Uh, obviously, the soft drink companies were there the next day. Um, the, this thing was announced on a Sunday. They were up there first thing Monday morning, and I, I don't think anybody believes that it's going to pass because it's too politically hot. But it was an interesting idea. The problem was how do you do the cut points? You know, Coke and Pepsi are easy. They're just sugars and water. And oh, I have to be careful, sugars, plural, because that's what the Sugar Association wanted to sue me about. Um, so sugars, plural. Um, the uh, you know, and, and they're candy. If you think of them as liquid candy, you think about soft drinks in a completely different way. Um, so I thought, you know, let's try it. It worked for cigarettes. Taxes were really discouraging of uh, people smoking, and that's been a good thing, um, I think, from a public health standpoint. So I thought it was worth an experimental try, and I was kind of sorry that it didn't pass. Um, but as I said, it wouldn't have been my first choice. The, uh, also, he was going to use that money for public education around health, which I also thought was, was good. Um, I much prefer positive kinds of things. For example, everybody is always complaining about the, the way food stamp recipients use their food stamps. I would like to let those, uh, you know, electronic cards that food stamp recipients have be worth twice as much or three times as much for fruits and vegetables as for anything that comes in a package. Nobody would notice except the recipients. It wouldn't be stigmatizing. It wouldn't be anything. And it would be, I think, strongly encouraging people to buy fruits and vegetables who feel that they're too expensive. In fact, they are too expensive. Um, the studies that have been done on the rise in prices in food show that the rise in prices of fruits and vegetables has greatly exceeded the rise in prices of soft drinks for anything. In fact, the, the relative price of soft drinks has declined, while that of fruits and vegetables has gone up quite a lot. So I think there's lots of little things we could do to tweak these things that might make a difference and that would be particularly helpful to lower income people. So anyway, that's kind of how I see it. Next question. If you get the microphone, you get to ask the question. I, uh, uh, you referred to processed foods just one time. You didn't say much or anything about whole grains mm -hmm. and our continued pouring out of, of lesser nutrient grains to mm -hmm. children and adults. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think about that? I think it's a hoax. I mean, I think these products that I've, I mean, I loved it when General Mills cereal got these big whole grain banners on the front and the amount of fiber in the cereal went from zero to one gram per serving. You know, I mean, it's, that's not, I don't think that's, if you want to eat whole grains, eat whole grains. 
uh, these processed foods have the grain processed out of them and you're not getting the benefit of them. It's about marketing. Um, does that answer? Oh, it's hard. I mean, they don't taste very good. It's hard. I mean, there's a reason why everybody likes white bread. Uh, it tastes better. Um, so you try to teach people how to use some of the grains. You mix it. You, you know, you mix it a quarter, you know, whole rice with white rice and, you know, kind of do it that way and do it gradually. But I think whole grains are a tough sell. They don't taste good. It's a problem. You know, except in, you know, it's an or let me put it another way, it's an acquired taste. <laughs> you were there, sir. Well, you read my mind. I was going to say, if we teach children in school and have it in the school cafeterias, mm -hmm. can they acquire a taste mm -hmm. where they get used to eating whole grains and the more mm -hmm. healthful foods rather than the processed? Yeah, if they're cooked well and taste good, kids will eat them. And if, and if there isn't an environment in which all these competing junk foods are around. You know, I mean, the problem is cleaning the environment in the schools so that somebody can actually make real food. It's very, very hard to do because that's how schools raise money is by selling junk food to kids. Um, you know, I think the vending machines should be out of schools. There didn't used to be vending machines in schools. I don't understand how they got there in the first place. Well, I do understand how they got there in the first place, but they need to be gone. You know, we need to have universal, health, uh, universal school meals for kids so that all kids are enrolled in the school lunch program and then maybe the schools would, ha would have enough money to run a decent lunch program. As long as you only have poor kids who are stigmatized beyond belief if they're participating in the school lunch program, you cannot have a successful school lunch program. We need universal school meals for kids and I don't care if it's free for everybody. I think the society should pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. Next question, ma'am. Yes. You said that one factor that is encouraging people to eat more was the availability of more calories because we were producing so much food. I wondered what you thought the impact of corn used for gas would be on that. And if well, that it raised the price. It raised the price. The first thing it did was raise the price of food. And there's a big article in the New York Times today about fuel, about corn being used for ethanol, and they're looking for, I mean, everybody has suddenly caught on that growing corn for ethanol is one of the big factors in the rise in food prices. And so they've, they've caught on to that and they're starting to look for non-food sources of ethanol. But I thought it was the most ill-conceived public policy to, to put all that money into subsidizing growing corn for ethanol. Does that make sense? You know, I mean, it's just, uh, it's inconceivable, except that's politics. It's how politics works. Next question, sir. Thank you for coming down. It was a really great talk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of my favorite news programs had somebody on, of course, the Colbert Report. Uh, had someone on recently who spoke about corporate food processors um, specifically addicting us to salty and sweet food. Uh, that, that, would be, that would be David Kessler. I think that's correct. Yeah, I didn't, Is that correct? I didn't see his performance. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to YouTube it, I guess. It was very good. Uh, but that sounds like his book. David Kessler was the... Uh, former commissioner of the FDA who um, is now at the University of California, San Francisco, where I worked for some number of years, uh, but not with him. Um, and he's somebody with a weight problem. And he personally discovered that um, he liked to eat junk food. And so he's turned that into sort of a, he talks about it as if it were an addiction. He, if, put a junk food in front of him and he couldn't not eat it. So he has this whole theory about how it's neurological and um, it's addictive and companies deliberately put in these things to addict you. I just think they put in things that people like. We like to eat sugar and salt. You know, we really do. Certainly sugar is innate and lots of people like the taste of salt and they like the taste of fat. I don't think you need elaborate neurological theories to explain it, but he's written a phenomenal bestseller. Um, I was very jealous because his publisher had a full page color advertisement 
on the back page of one of the sections of the New York Times. None of my pu publishers ever did that for me. <laughs> so I'm just jealous. Anyway, it's a great read. Um, and, you know, I read it and I thought, what's new here? He just, where's he been? You know, there's nothing new here. But people who I know, who I respect, who've read it, said that they really got something out of it and that it changed the way they thought about eating. And in that sense, it's probably very valuable. I can't imagine what Colbert said. It must have been fun. <laughs> Question. Ma'am, we'll start with you back there. She who holds the microphone asks the question. My pyramid, how much politics and how much good science? Science? <laughs> what science? Um, oh, I don't, the, I mean, the only thing I can say about my pyramid is don't use it. Don't even try. It's impossible to teach. I don't understand. You know, does anybody know what it is? It's the Department of Agriculture's revision of the politically sensitive old pyramid that was clearly hierarchical and it made it clear you were supposed to eat more plant foods than meat and dairy foods. And when they revised it, it's got all these colors. It's just a pyramid with, it has no food on it. It just has these color streamers, which one of, one of my gay friends said, oh, it's our flag. Um, <laughs> You know, you got to have a, I, I watched the release of the pyramid. I was up at Cornell, where I also have a visiting professorship, and I was watching it with community nutrition students, and they had gotten this TV feed, and we were all in this classroom together. And uh, the people who were releasing it said, it's really great. You just go on uh, your computer, and you type in mypyramid.gov and it just, you can type in how much you weigh and how old you are and whatever and it'll tell you how many calories you need. And I could hear all these students behind me saying, our clients don't have computers. Our clients don't have computers. You know, I mean, I don't know, I, I mean, I can understand why they did that because they don't have any money for public education. But the pyramid has no food on it. It's got this guy running up the pyramid. Um, any question that was asked at the press conference was answered by, you should join a gym and get exercise equipment. And I could hear this chorus behind me, our clients don't join gyms. Our clients don't have exercise equipment. And I talked to nutritionists who try to use it to teach their clients about how to eat better. It's hopeless. Forget it. Don't use it. That would be my advice. I suppose it's going to be revised when the dietary guidelines get revised, which is in process right now. Um, and I don't know what they'll do in the dietary guidelines. I mean, anytime you have a committee report, they have to throw out what was done before and start over. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I'd go back and use the old one. I like the old one. Ma'am, you're right there. a question and a commercial. Okay. I'll do the commercial first. Okay. I'm the chair of the Arkansas Obesity Coalition. Ah. Lots of people here today, if you want to be part of that coalition, we're working on a lot of things that we hope will help change nutrition, thinking, policy in Arkansas. And there's several of us here that would be glad to take your name and phone number. Thanks. My question is, if we could do one thing, if we could help a community do one thing, what do you think the most important thing would be for that community to do? Teach them how to cook. Mm. 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 Well, I mean, I think people want to eat, or a lot of people want to eat healthfully. Not everybody, but for people who do, they don't have a clue what to do with it. I hear this so much from um, supermarket owners or, or people who work in supermarkets who say, people come up to us and say, what do I do with it? What do I do with it? Teach people to cook and teach their kids to cook. Teach kids to cook. It will completely change their relationship to food. Time for one more question. You back there, sir. Hi. Um, one of the uh, things I've been studying in one of my food studies courses is um, the effect of um, 
the new, the new sort of organic foods movement um, has had on the agribusiness mm -hmm. um, and, and how a lot of these agribusiness um, um, corporations have, have taken some of the higher organic standards because of the fact that a lot of these organic standards aren't, well, they're not really standards, they're sort of, sort of guidelines and so they're not really enforced and so a lot of these big companies in, in, in an effort to get, you know, greener, um, have, have sort of taken down these standards. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about, about how the sort of idea of eating organic, which is great, has, has the potential of possibly um, um, lowering the standards of, of what we consider mm -hmm. organic foods. Yeah. That's a complicated question. The, the operative word here is co-optation. That is the uh, taking over of ideas by, in this case, corporations, and using them for their own purposes. The organic standards are real, and they're rules, and they are enforced. Um, whether, they, whether they are high enough, whether they are comprehensive enough, whether they have too many loopholes, those are all things that could be argued. But they have a very precise meaning under the Department of Agriculture's regulations, which is plant foods, plant crops cannot be, um, the, you can't use certain kinds of chemical insecticides, pesticides, fertilizers. Um, they can't be irradiated, genetically modified, or fertilized with sewage sludge. Um, if it's animals, you can't use antibiotics or hormones. They have to have access to the outdoors. That's one of the loopholes. They don't have to actually be outdoors. They have to have access to the outdoors. Not the same thing. Um, and so forth and so on. And those are enforced because there are inspectors. How well they're enforced, we can argue, but there is a certification system and an inspection system System, and most people who are involved in it think it's pretty clean. The argument is whether the standards are adequate and whether they address what the organic proponents thought from the beginning, which was that the food should be grown sustainably. There's nothing in the organic standards about sustainability, about replacing the nutrients that are taken out of the soil so that they will be there for future generations. And that's something that's been argued about and argued about. However, the new administration has appointed to the Department of Agriculture one of the strongest original proponents of the original organic standards to be an assistant secretary of agriculture. Um, is that co-optation? Is she going to have, be completely, have her hand tied, hands tied? Or is she going to be able to do something? We don't know yet. It's too early. So I think it's too early to see how all of that is going to play out. What the big corporations have done is to buy up organic businesses. That's an easy way to do it. That way you get to have it both ways, right? You can have your industrial agriculture and your organic. You know, you can have your Kellogg cereals and your Kashi cereals, and they're all owned by the same company. Um, so, I mean, it's uh, it's... These are businesses, and there's, uh, I think there's, you know, if, if it were up to me, I'd like to see more attention paid to locally grown agriculture, preferably organic, preferably both. And I don't think everybody should be eating everything local. I think that's impossible. But if everybody bought a little bit more local food, it would do wonders for local farmers. And there's a big farming movement, too. Last year was the first year in the last hundred years that the number of small farms increased. And I don't know how many of you have seen the report, in the, also in the New York Times, about college students who are doing internships on farms. There's real interest in farming, real interest in it. And I think that's something that should be encouraged, and it's one of the things that the Obama's planting that garden really sent a signal that this is a valuable thing for people to be doing and I hope we'll be doing a lot more of it. So thank you very much. <laughs>